Module 5, Structural Variant Coding. So it's where coding variants start to become harder. So we see that it was quite, quite easy for SNP. Indels was, was a little bit more tricky, but um, for SNP it was not, it was not so bad. Uh, so in the, the Structural Variant Coding, so we will, I will first try to understand what is structural variant? Because um, not all, not everybody uh, know what is a, a structural variant. Um, how we can find them? So there are many ways to do it. Um, how each strategy was the strength and the weakness of each strategy. Uh, and then we will go uh, in um, well, quickly in um, uh, look what are the signals of uh, structural variant in your data. And we will explore, uh, visually explore the, the SV. So what, what are the structural variants? Uh, so it's genomic rearrangement. So this tree load is something that has been uh, choose, but it's not something fixed. It's, uh, it's variant, structural variants larger than what we call indels. So some people will say indels are structural variants, some other, some other people know. So mainly, <coughs> Everything that is more than 50 base power. Uh, so this includes deletion, insertion, inversion, mobile element, uh, transposition, duplication, translocation. When people start to use, to look at uh, structural variants, um, NGS was not existing in this technique. So the way they did it was doing either by karyotyping to look at <coughs> events like this one where you have translocation or to do fish or all this kind of technique. So you can imagine, in that cases, the resolution and the accuracy was not really, really good. So just an example, in cancer, structural variants are a really important uh, feature of your genomes. Uh, because uh, in cancer, you don't have any, in cancer cells, you don't have a selection uh, pressure, so your genome can sometimes become quite crazy. So it's why sometimes you see chromotrypsis, all these kind of features that your genome is breaking in, in many parts and rearrange. So this is an example of a uh, cancer karyotype. You see that a lot of uh, chromosomes are copy, have copy number change, like this one. A lot of other have mixed two of different several chromosomes. So it's why uh, when we start to study the, the genetic of cancer, we, with the, the, <coughs> this kind of study needs higher resolution that these techniques can, uh, can provide. So the different class of SV are the copy number variation, so large deletion and duplication, <coughs> the, copy the copy neutral rearrangement, inversion, translocation, and the, the other type of structural var uh, variants, so uh, novel insertion or transposition of uh, mobile element. Just to give you an idea, when we talk about structural variants, we always uh, talk about what's happening in the sample when we compare it to the reference. Because uh, if we look at, the, if you take the genome of the sample, you don't, it, it's a deletion if you compare to something. So you always need to compare to the reference. So this is deletion, you lose a part, insertion, you have include this, this section, so insertion of mobile element, so transposition, tandem duplication, interpreted duplication, inversion, so this part has been inverted and translocation. Everybody is uh, okay with that because if you don't get that, you will be lost for the rest of the, of the, of the, of the presentation. So, so as I tell you, the technique to detect uh, um, uh, structural variant have evolved. Uh, at the beginning, uh, like 60, 60 years ago, we were doing karyotyping, then we were doing fish, then we start to do microarray, especially for uh, copy number variation, and now we are at the uh, level of the high throughput uh, uh, sequencing and the high resolution. Just to give you an idea of how the technique evolves, when you start from when we were doing uh, CGH array, we were just able to detect the variation of copies, but not this kind of complex, more complex signals. And 
when the technology starts to evolve, usually it gives you more information, more signals, so you can be able to detect uh, more different type or more complex type of events, but it's more complicated to do the coding. So suggestion was really easy. Now SNIF using using NGS way more complicated to do the, the variant call. Uh, just to give you an idea of how we can detect in a general manner the, some um, some structural variant uh, or some variants in general. So here you get a, a, a point mutation how you can detect with uh, NGS. So you look at variant reads in Delta. You look at missing uh, part of the reads large. Deletion, you look at region where you don't see or less see less read. Duplication, where you accumulate more reads. And structural variants, you will look, what is complicated with a specific structural variants, that, that you will need to have reads that give you specific patterns of the specific um, uh, structural variant. So here I just give an example of uh, a, a translocation, but each type of structural variant could have a specific signature to be identified in your, um, in your genome and in your mapping. So the different strategy we use, we have, four, we have four strategy that we can use to detect a structural variant. So the read pair, so the read depth, I will, I will, give you, I will go in detail in each uh, method, so don't worry. The split read and the assembly approach. So the read pair, the idea is to identify uh, structural variant uh, breakpoints by examining the alignment of your reads. So, when you do your uh, sequencing, you know the, uh, library, the size selection you have made on your, uh, on, your, on your library. And you know that if you fragment span over a breakpoint of a structural variant, that will affect um, the, the inside size or the orientation of your reads. So the, the read pair is really focused on uh, examining cluster of reads that show abnormal uh, inside size or abnormal orientation to detect uh, the structural variant. This technique is limited by the fragment size. So the larger your fragment size will be, the uh, larger your, your sensitivity will be. So it's really based on the inner size and the orientation, which is bad in this graph because it should be, the two reads should be based one of the other. So what, what the, this type of method do, so they, they estimate the uh, distribution of your inside sites, so what your means, and then based on the distribution, they estimate the standard deviation of your inside size. Then you choose which level of sensitivity you want uh, to do your coding. So you say you, you choose how many standard deviation I, I consider as a concordant uh, best pair. So two SD, three SD, and then everything that is out of this, uh, of this result is called discordant. And then you have this flag about your read, my, my, my read that are discordant because they, have, uh, they, they are not as the other. And then you, you look if this read show cluster because you could have discordant by chance. In that case, you will find discordant pair spread everywhere or discordant by biology, where, as we, where you see many reads that uh, accumulate at this uh, location. So to give you an idea, when you have concordant reads, you have your uh, reference genome, you have your test genome here, and you, and you expect to see your read in the correct orientation, in the correct distance. If you have a deletion, you expect your read where it starts to be tricky in, in, in line. If you have deletion, you expect your inside size to be larger. So because you in the reference genome, there's a piece that you have missed. So, okay, because what you have to think is in your test genome, the size of the, the size of the fragment <coughs> is correct in your in your test genome. It's just when you replace it on the reference genome that it starts to be discordant because something is different between your the, your test genome and your reference genome. The same way when you are uh, spanning an insertion. You, you expect to see uh, your uh, inside size lower because there's a fragment that is in your uh, test genome that is not in the reference, so they will uh, collapse uh, the read together. Here you can see what is the limitation of your, um, of your data. If your insertion is too large, 
then you will not be able to have read that span over the insertion and will lose it. So where having longer reads could be an advantage, or having bad pair, or when we have tandem duplication, what we'll see, we'll see some reads that are with uh, so in the in the reference genome with large inter size but a change in the orientation because this read here will just catching the junction of the of the two copy. If you if you got an inversion, you will have on one side a large insertion with inversion of one uh, of one read only, large insertion and uh, inversion of the other read for the other breakpoint. Uh, so if you got more complex, if you have this insertion of so from a other region, you will have reads that span from one location to the other, and from the other end of the of the of the inserted region to the location. So it's sometimes hard to if the if the B section is too large, it's sometimes hard to make difference between um, large uh, distant genomic insertion and translocation. Because that would be the signal of if you take only this pair alone, that could be the same signal as you see in um, uh, translocation. But if you are, if you've got the other signal that tell you, okay, this is not a translocation, this is an insertion from another region. So we start to see that the more it becomes complex, the more difficult the, the calling and to make sense of, the, of what you see on your, on your alignment. Um, so this is how it works. This is a really non-exhaustive list of uh, a repair color. And today we'll use daily to do the calling. Uh, you will understand why we use daily because it has main advantages, uh, but, but I will take, tell you later. So just to tell you, when you do read pair calling only, uh, mostly you will detect deletion because it's a major part of event, and other has really trouble to define what is the uh, the other type of uh, variant. And you see, there's no uh, so this is all the, the code. What's the main issue with this method? is when you face complex region, like this one, where you get pair with different insert size, with deletion, understanding what's happened is not easy. You are able to flag that. You have an event there, probably multiple events there, but you're not able to understand, uh, to make sense of, of it. So what are the, the strengths and limits of, the, of this method? So, um, the, the limits, it's difficult to interpret when you are in a repetitive genomes because the mapping will, be, um, will not be good in, in a repetitive genomes, so you could have bad mapping. So but if you have bad mapping, you have bad, bad signals. Uh, it's difficult to characterize complex region, and you have a, right, a high rate of false positive because when you choose the result, sometimes you could choose too, too small or too, too, uh, too high. Um, one of the strengths is that almost all type of uh, variant could be uh, detected. The second method, the split read. So the idea of the split read is to identify um, reads that contain the breakpoint. So here we have when we when we use the paired the paired uh, the, the paired read, we were trying to find um, fragments that contain the breakpoints. Here the split read try to find reads, so small part that, that contains a breakpoint. So the idea is when you have a, a, an event, you will have reads that will be correctly mapped because he's mapping one of the region, and reads that he will have trouble to map because he's directly over the, the breakpoint. And to catch these reads that, are, that have trouble to map, and to understand why and to speak with them. As for um, the, for the uh, paired read, uh, for the paired read method, Having, having a long read is better because you have more chance to go over the breakpoint. And also because you could have multiple breakpoints in complex region that will be on the same read. So uh, now a lot of uh, structural variations are done, for example, with uh, long read technology and with a synthetic long read like 10x. We try to do um, haplotypes and see 
as we are able to mark read of the same of the types of the same fragments, we are able to, to understand a little bit more the complex region. So how it works? You have your read, you align. So most of your read will be aligned perfectly on the genomes, and some of the reads will have trouble to map uh, one of the two uh, reads. So either it will be only part of the of the read that will be mapped, or or the full read will be on that. But usually we focus on on a read where the read have been have been um, split, break to map only one region, and we have, we have the other region that is either mapped elsewhere or unmapped. So the idea is to detect this kind of signals. So if you talking about a deletion, you look at your reads. You have got one pair that is correctly mapped, and the other. So if it was a pair, uh, read pair map mapping, you will have seen large intersection. But here you see reads that have aligned at this point, and you look at the other part of the read. So the method will break the read and realign the uh, read over close to the to in the proximity of the, of the first one and try to find another part of the read that is um, that could map the region and find the, the, the where the, the data is in terms of insertion in the same way you expect to see to have two parts of your of your read your read break in three pair, in three parts and two of them stack together so you can clearly see here the limitation of that of that approach if the insertion is too long, you won't be able to find the other uh, region. Again, it's why now for structural variants, uh, we tend to use a lot of uh, the long read or met, or met pair or synthetic read to get this information. Now, if we look in terms of uh, inversion, as you remember, it was for uh, <coughs> read pair also is also called parallel mapping. So the read pair approach will tell you inver inversion of the of the um, inversion of the of the read orientation and high um, uh, inter size. Here you expect to see a read that is split here and going um, mapped to another place with an inversion of the end of the read. So this is all this kind of signature you can explain, which which are different of the of the read pair. So as you can see. In all this figure, I always told you, show you the split read versus the, the, the read pair because uh, if you search the word for split mapping, it gives a lot of false positive because you can have split because of a lot of reason and so. Um, so now the split read mapping alone is not really used, but it's used in combination of the, of the read pair. So now the norm now is to use combination of both. Uh, so, and the advantages is that uh, usually you don't have the breakpoint with a, with a pattern, with a read pair, whereas uh, the speed read can you give it, given the, the, the real breakpoint at the, at the base uh, level. And it's also better than read pair in terms of small deletion. Because when you do read pair, you need to have enough. Um, enough um, standard deviation to detect the, the, the deletion, where when you have a read that is break into pieces, average is a deletion of five, four bases, you, you are able to catch it. So the split read tool are this one, and you can see that, oh, some of them are also tools that do uh, read pair. So the two main tools actually for um, structural variants that, that I recommend and that we use is Delhi and Lumpy. Which are the two tools that use the, the boss, app, boss approach, and uh, daily also provide also additional features. That's the one we would use, and his author uh, is uh, Tobias Roche um, in Germany, and he's really a nice guy. You, you write to him, and you have usually in the next two days you have an answer to your to your to your, to your question. It's really a nice guy. I'm teaching with him at um, another meet, another workshop. So the weakness of the method is to. Uh, you need to have sufficient coverage to have enough reads that, uh, to span your um, breakpoint. Uh, and you could have a false positive in a mapped region. The strength, it could work uh, in addition to the read pair. It provides uh, best resolution of the breakpoint. And it can detect very short events. 
The next method is the read depth. So the read depth is based on a, a simple rationale. Is when you do when you do your sequencing, you expect to have a homogeneous representation of your fragment all along the genomes. So when you want to look, so the read depth is dedicated to look copy number variation. So when you want to look copy number variation, uh, so if you have read that are homogeneous all over the genomes. If you have deletion, you will have less read or no read in the region. If you have duplication, amplification, you will have more reads because you have more uh, fragment of DNA of this region. So the way it works, you take your genome, you divide your genome in bin of equal size, you estimate the depth of coverage in each bin, and you look for a cluster of consecutive bin that show a significant excess or loss of your depth of coverage. So it's really simple approach. It's really based on what has been developed with um, CJ Chari uh, 10, 20 years ago. So it's really simple and, and naive. So just give you kind of overview. Uh, and oh, we don't see him. So here's an example of what you can see. So if you look at your coverage, your general coverage, you have your general coverage, and you have got your amplification. We see there's a bump of coverage, and we see the bump of read. This is an example. So in cancer, what we use, uh, this is an example of one of the tools, one tool I've developed, which is called SCONE, uh, which is dedicated only to uh, cancer samples. So you've got the depth of coverage uh, represented in your tumor, in your normal, and the uh, log ratio. And you see that it's worked really well to detect this kind of event, so large chromosomal uh, variation. But there is a problem with this method. The problem is that, so the problem if we go back here, uh, I don't know if we see that you see your, your coverage is not homogeneous. So the main assumption of the method is wrong. It's not wrong, but it's, it's true for most of the part of the genome, but for, not for all. So in a general uh, population, when you do copy number for, like for neurogenitive disease where you have good quality, it's work well. When you start to work in cancer, there's the, the variation is usually slightly because you have NSA purity, cell variety, clonality of, of this event. So if you have a variation and you vari your variation you are looking at are smaller, make the difference between the general variation and the biological variation could be tricky. So what, the, what we think, what the method think the, the, the coverage is, is like that. You have been with equal uh, with equal depth of coverage. <coughs> Could you still hear me? Yeah, bin with equal uh, depth of coverage. And when you see an event, you have a variation of your depth of coverage. What the reality is, like that. You have been with variation, with natural variation, because some sequence, some genomic, are more complicated to catch, some, some genomic sequence. And so you've got variation, some references missing, so, so you've got all this natural variation, and then you try to find this bin among this one. So you see, it could be quite tricky to, to find. So in a perfect world, when you have seen of coverage, you start to limit this variation, catching all the complicated region. It's good, but if you, in a hard to, uh, in a region hard to map, if you are done enough enough coverage, it could be really tricky. So there's this tool that is developed in the whole lab by one PhD student. I have to say, I have one tool for cancer, but this tool kick the ass of my tools. <laughs> At one condition, if you have enough samples. If you have more than 20 third samples, go with this tool, cancer, no cancer, it kick the ass of everybody. What? We don't, we are still telling you need to give a real number because usually we, are, we say, but you don't have time to, you don't have time yet to to do the benchmarking to see what the limit of the detection, but us, we said 20 to be safe, but you already ran with, with 12 or 13 samples. So the idea of this tool is when you can imagine you have this variation, imagine you have a set of, uh, so this, this is genomic windows in one sample, so all the methods that we use do normalization horizontally between the bin. So now imagine you can stack this graph in each sample. And then for each bin, instead of normalizing horizontally, you will normalize vertically. 
So you will take the send bin, like here, and you will take the send bin and normalize the data over every sample for this bin. And you will see what is the natural variation you could expect for this bin. And you do it, and you have the natural variation in your cohort, and then you compare your sample, and you see your sample is in the natural variation, and then, oh, you're out of the natural variation. So then you are in a, in a copy number. So it's uh, Jean Monon that published that, and it's available here. So, yes? What if you have the copy number variation in a significant proportion to the population? So for sure? Say 30%. Uh, so then if you're normalizing that group, yeah, so you will, you will call probably, um, so 30% <laughs> you will call, you, you probably will call it correctly, yeah, but if it's the opposite, if you have like 60% of your sample, uh, you will probably call the ones that don't have the variation. Okay, so it must be yeah. Just to give you an idea, we, we use the same approach to do a single cell, um, single cell recognition. So we set a put, we put a set of single cells and we want to know which one are real uh, cancer, which one are, are uh, contamination from normal neural tissue. And we do it by copy number. So we're able to display the two groups like this by this method. And then we, we need to dig to find which, which group are the cancer, which group are the, are the normal. But it's really efficient to make the difference. So except if you have like 95%, um, uh, I will say it won't be wrong. Um, so the tool you can use, it does a lot, a lot of tools. So this is mine, this is Papesve, this is older. This one is also one that tries to use population information, but the way is really, uh, it, it's not as good as uh, Papesve. And uh, you see that many tools are for general copy number, and there's not so much uh, somatic uh, dedicated tool, because it's more complicated. So people create a tool for the easiest one. Yeah? Can you resolve You cannot make the difference. You can say there's duplication, but you cannot make, um, say, if it's tandem or uh, interspersed duplication. With, exactly. If you combine with a parallel. So actually, uh, PopSV, uh, the author, is working on adding this additional information to uh, add a better gen typing of the, of the event and to uh, also work on how to define the breakpoint. Yeah. Do you apply the standard for uh, verification? No. Okay. No, it's only for copy number variation. So what are the strengths and uh, limits of this method? So um, actually, we still have lower uh, limit, lower resolution of the copy number event, uh, five to ten KB. Else, we are able to go to three three KB. So, but the the low the Maximum resolution you will you will use the higher level of uh, noise you will have in your signals because to have low to have a high resolution you need to cut your bin in a really really small um, small bin small size bin and you face more uh, genomic context variation of your of your sequence so you have you increase the, the variation of your signals when you have small bin um, so us when we work we usually work with bin of one kb. And we say, okay, to need to, to be a copy number, we need to have three to five um, consecutive bin to see the same signals. The breakpoint are ambiguous because the breakpoint, it's as you work as bin, which one KB you can imagine, you cannot make the difference of the breakpoint uh, in the bin. So now some tools try to solve that doing um, sliding windows bin to refine the breakpoint, but it's really more compute time to do to, to do that. Uh, you cannot look at balanced rearrangement. Everything that do, do not change the, the, num, the, the quantity of DNA. But the strength is it is fast, simple. It is easy to interpret. As you see the graph, when you see the graph, when you see there's the addition amplification, it's really easy to understand. Uh, it uh, gives a copy number, which many tool, many the other methods do not give you the copy number. They give you even, but not uh, how many copies you have. And um, if you use PopSV, uh, it's able to catch the data with low coverage, low mapping, low bin mapping, 
and uh, with low resolution. So it's really good. The next method is to do assembly. So the rationale is why did I, should I have to map my reads to the genome where I know that I'm looking for events that are different from my uh, genomes. So I know that my mapping will be hard because of this event. And especially because the size of my read are, are small. So the event could be larger of my read of my, or my fragment. So the, the rationale between uh, this method is to do, OK, forget about mapping at the first time. Just do assembly of the, of the sequence. And when you generate your contigs, you have large uh, sequence, contigy sequence. Then you can map to the, to the reference genomes and see how it's different from the reference genomes. And you will have more chance to resolve the complex region or larger, larger event. There's two approach for the uh, assembly approach. The ones that do local world genome assembly and the ones that do uh, local assembly. So if you do a uh, world genome assembly, so it's what I tell you, you take, forget about the mapping, take all your read, do no, the level assembly of your, uh, of your genomes. When you have your read, you blast them, you got how you, you, got, you, you got how you scaffold, how your contigs work together, how you split your contigs, and a little bit as a split read approach, how you, you, your contigs split into the reference, and you're able to, um, to uh, determine the, the structural variance. It has the main advantage that it's really working well to uh, catch the logo insertion and, uh, the, and um, deletion events. Doing a whole genome assembly of uh, human, it's uh, time and resource con uh, uh, time consuming and resource consuming. Uh, if we go, uh, I'm collaborating with a guy in, uh, at BC Center, at the BC Center at, uh, in Vancouver. They do it. There's, it's a way they do for, for looking for structural variants, but they have only they have one cluster that is only dedicated to, the, to that. So you need to have, because it's really uh, resource intensive. Can you just uh, do it, the actual alignment? Because uh, the bulk of the sample will just align yeah. flawlessly. You, and then use that as a scaffold to then reassemble the genome based on the non-aligning elements to okay. Exactly. That's the other part. Oh. The local level assembly. So the local level assembly, you map your reads, you get level insertion, and you will end up uh, with reads that map to the genome normally. You say, I don't care. Reads that didn't map to the genome because for novel insertion or a sequence that is not able to map. And you say, so what we call the orphan, so the two reads unmap. So you take the, your orphan, your unmap reads, and you will end up with what we call one and incorrect reads, which means you have one read that is mapped correctly and the other that is unmapped. And you take also these two reads. Then what you do, you take this subset of reads, which is really uh, like, depending on the amount of copy of structural variants you have and insertion, but it, it's really like few percent of your uh, of your reads. So you have really uh, a reduced number of reads, and then you do the assembly. So you, you don't expect to assemble large sequence, so it's really much easier, really much feasible. And you obtain uh, your uh, context. And then what you do, you have your context, and you map the uh, one end of the read on your contig, and you expect to have this read to be at the edge of your uh, of the contig you have assembled, and then you are able to uh, anchor where this contig goes in your genomes based on where the uh, other read maps, and then you are able to resolve uh, the, the structure of the region. So it's a uh, the method that is now more used, and it's. Uh, really working well for insertion and all this kind of, of, um, of, of analysis. And then you just need to, to blast your, your content. But in, in both of those cases, you still have the issue that you know, you're, you're not actually, if you have n repeats, so you can't actually assemble with n repeats, yeah. you still see just pile up and then you have to predict that must be an yeah, a exactly. competitive assumption. Exactly. So you will have. Unless you have a very long read yeah. that would read through the entire mm -hmm. canon repeat. Yeah. The, the problem with standard repeat is that probably you read once uh, beyond map. Mm -hmm. So you won't catch it in that uh, method because your read will be mapped with specific, specific um, uh, orientation or exercise. 
So this method won't, won't get it. Whereas the full assembly probably will have better resolution for, for that. So this is the pattern you, you, you will look. It's quite similar to what we the pattern we observe for split read, but you can imagine that we have sequence of of KB longs or more. So it's really more easier to to, uh, to detect this pattern. So this is the different tool you can use to do um, assembly. Uh, so there's at the time I prepare, I don't know, I don't didn't check if there's uh, one tool that is working to do that on its own. So most of the time when I do it, I do it. Uh, by myself, so do the different steps and then do the assembly. So that's why I tell you the different um, assembler you can use to do assembly. So you've got Cortex, SGA, Discover, Abyss, Ray, and a lot of others. So what are the strengths and uh, limitations of the uh, assembly method? So it's computationally very intensive, or either the local assembly is still uh, intensive. Uh, and it starts to resolve a repetitive and complex uh, region because your read uh, will, the assembly will break on, on your piece. The strand, you have a best per resolution of breakpoint because you have all, all, um, all really the, 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 the real sequence. And if you do, um, if you do the whole genome, you have, in theory, uh, almost all the, the class of variation you can, you can see. And especially the, the small deletion on the small insertion. Just to give you a summary of the strategy, so you've got the four different depths of coverage, uh, pair mapping or, or uh, read, uh, read pair, split read, and the novel assembly. So the resolution, the difficulty is low. When the difficulty is low, usually your resolution is low. So when you want to look at large events, you take this method, and the more uh, resolution you want, the more work and um, Difficulty, cost, and noise you will face up. Uh, so, a kind of summary of the of the S3 detection. We have four different methods. Uh, more recent tool, now try to combine uh, different methods. Delhi, LMP, soon PopSV with the for the breakpoint. But whatever the method you use, there will be it's really challenging. There is no perfect method to do that. Uh, when we do, um, when we call SV, we we'll use many tools. As we do, we do a kind of uh, assemble approach. We do several uh, colors and try to see what is concurrent between the several colors. We use several approach. And what is complicated is to resolve to to not to do the call, but sometimes to understand what you have, what your what your color have uh, output, because many many uh, events will be marked as unknown type of. Uh, SV, because you have complex region and it's not easy to make uh, to understand this region. Challenge is to find the breakpoint exactly, and the validation, because validated uh, deletion is easy. You put two two uh, PCR probe at each border of the of the of the deletion, and you see if you amplify the region or not. Because if you have a larger one, you will you will see the size of your fragment. But when you start to uh, want to amplify a large insertion or large event, it's complicated to validate the data uh, technically. Now, in terms of uh, visualization, uh, this is the type of uh, visualization we, we, we saw. We you, you already saw it uh, yesterday with uh, Florence. So when you have uh, an IGV, when you have a deletion, you have reads that span uh, with a large uh, insert size, and, and you clearly see generally a drop of coverage in between. And duplication, so tandem duplication, you have the read with large duplication, and which means that probably this fragment is added to the other side. Inversion, you have this read that runs to with this one, this read that runs to this one. So here I should have put when you put when you ask IGV to put read in the pair view, it will be easier to easier to understand the insertion. You have this amount of code that oops, sorry, that go from here to another place. And uh, usually, when people, uh, when we do counter, when we try to uh, visualize um, um, SV, what we use, especially for counter, we use a uh, circle spot. And you have, so your reference genome, you, you put your coverage and you have points for different type of event, and you've got translocation that show you where some read jump from one place to the other, and that's it. <laughs>